to dive in and see. Hey, what's up everybody? Steve Bauman here and today we're going to be drawing a human skull. Uh, you should be able to see the source image on the screen and also uh, please just anybody let me know that the audio is okay in the comments so I know I'm not talking to, uh, to nobody. I've already got like a bunch of questions to kind of get into so I'm just going to kind of dive in and and start drawing. This is, uh, by the way, like a Stonehenge paper and um, I'm drawing with uh, right now with like a 4H pencil. So anyway, here we go. <laughs> uh, this, by the way, is like the analog live stream that I think everybody's been uh, kind of asking for, pretty excited about. Um, I've been doing like some more digital live streams and things. I, I like doing them. Uh, of course, it's not like my my kind of first calling uh, as a medium, but um, you know, uh, I still think it's like really. Uh, I really kind of like working digitally, but that's another story. Um, so yeah, hope you're. Uh, by the way, I hope everybody's kind of taking the opportunity to uh, uh, to draw along at home. Uh, just because I think it's like a nice way to stay motivated, get some things done. Uh, let me just check and see if the audio is good. And it is. All right. So MJ's uh, the first one to leave a question, which is not uh, particularly surprising. But uh, MJ is like, he is on top of, of, of everything uh, in terms of online learning. Uh, but he was asking, what are online students missing out on doing portrait and figure drawings uh, and not cast studies like most atelier students are doing? Well, what you're missing out on, well, so cast studies are like an interesting, uh, I, I really loved the whole like kind of cast drawing program that, that I went through uh, when I was a student. And for that reason, I think if you, don't eventually like study plaster casts, I think you could be missing a lot in the sense that they are this really incredibly demanding like static subject, right? They're, they're very unforgiving and they are the first place where I think you go to translate three dimensions into two dimensions. You know, in in my uh, series of drawing lectures, the, um, the Drawing Essentials lecture series, I talk about like what are some of the primary challenges that you face as a 2D artist. Chief among them, of course, is that your world is flat. We have just this flat paper to, uh, to work with. And our first challenge is to try to say to the world in some way that that what we're actually working on is is round so so that this skull that I'm drawing here is uh, has volume and uh, oh by the way <laughs> yeah I should mention so a lot of you that are watching this online you're seeing this in perspective so like uh, this is gonna look a lot skinnier than what the uh, what the skull that you're looking at here is you know, uh, since I'm shooting with a DSLR, I can't really put the camera kind of right in front of me. So that's kind of just how it is. Uh, I think that in a way, like you're not, not, you're definitely not like missing anything from, uh, uh, from, you know, kind of looking at the drawing or whatever, looking at the process. But just because this is live, I'm not able to give you the, um, the kind of edited perspective fixed version of it uh, as of now. But that's just live. That's life in the live stream world. Um, yeah, so yeah, what are you missing? Uh, you're basically missing the opportunity to, opportunity to start translating uh, three dimensions into two dimensions. Uh, when you're working from photographs and things, you're starting out in that kind of 2D world. And uh, that definitely is uh, is a version of, of missing something, for sure. So on to the next question, Shane Mooney asks, do you do critiques for Patreon members? I do critiques, I do, there is a mentorship program on my Patreon page. It's got a limited number of spaces, obviously, because, you know, I, I only have so much time every month, I can't uh, be everywhere at once. 
and because of that, you know, the, the spaces are often not available. Uh, so, I mean, yes, the, I do critiques, but if I just did critiques for everybody, literally everyone on my Patreon page, I would never be able to do anything else. So, unfortunately, I have to limit that to just a, a few people. Abhishek Basak is asking, minimum, how many hours should we put on our work? to become a professional artist. Now, as I've said, like in previous streams, I just want to like, make sure that we kind of preface this with we're talking about representational art, we're talking about in a way, doing kind of what I'm doing here is just drawing stuff that that looks like stuff. Uh, because I think the, the the rules and boundaries for that are, are far different than they are for a lot of other uh, a lot of other disciplines. So uh, when I say like, oh, I think, you know, you should be doing this or you should be doing that, it's, it's kind of all related to that idea that we all have kind of the same goal that we're trying to, uh, we're all trying to get to that place where our drawing looks like the, the thing that we're making it up, right? So in those terms, like what should you be uh, doing hours wise? I can tell you what I did as a student. Maybe that's like the best way to actually go through this. When I was a student, uh, the program that I went to, we would spend six hours during, during the daytime each day for like from nine to four. We would spend that uh, drawing in the drawing program, of course. And then if we were, obviously we moved on to the painting program, uh, you'd, you'd spend that time painting. And we did that for the, f well, the drawing program was the first probably nine months of the program. And then after that, we, uh, yeah, it was the same. But so there was six hours during the day and then you'd have an evening class as well. So you'd have uh, an evening class that was about two hours. So you'd have like an evening drawing to do also. Um, and getting used to that pace, I think it was like really, <laughs> it was like really hard at uh, first. I remember just being like my first term just being super physically exhausted, just totally beat down by uh, by the pace of it. Because also, you know, where I was studying, we, we were we would study, we would stand up while we were drawing and painting. Uh, so you were kind of on your feet for six to eight hours a day, which, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're working a job you can understand like that, that that you can stand up that long but I just think it was a combination of like mental and physical uh, challenge you know you're 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 coming up against all of your problems in drawing and you're standing up and you're exhausted and you're probably I was in like uh, living in a foreign country for the first time so there's a lot of things that were uh, really tough to um, uh, to assimilate all in all in one moment. Um, so yeah, probably, and I did that for uh, about four years. Uh, I studied, so so that was how long it took me. Um, eighteen. Someone's uh, Shane Mooney is saying eighteen hours a day. Yeah, well, it felt like it, maybe. Uh, Empire Micah is asking if you leave the artwork on the. Oh, do I leave the artwork on the wooden panels after stretching Stonehenge paper, or do you remove it from the panel to frame it? So what he's referring to here is the fact that like most times I draw on paper that's stretched over a panel. That's not the case here. This is just taped onto a, taped onto a board. But in general, yes, the answer is I, I do leave my drawings on top of the birch panels uh, when I frame them. I think it actually, it allows me to kind of frame things, uh, drawings a little bit more like a painting, which something that just in general I, I like, you know, um, part of it is, you know, <laughs> if uh, you've heard me talk a lot about this stuff before, you know, like drawing is, you know, a lot of times takes a little bit of a backseat to painting, you know, like gallerists, they always want to deal with painting. I mean, let's say actually most gallerists, you know, there are certainly galleries that, that get it. Um, you know, that understand uh, that, that drawing is like this amazing art form and, you know, you should be able to make great expression in that, in that field as well. Um, but in general, right, you're just going to come across uh, galleries that would like to uh, have paintings. 
but for me, you know, so I try to like kind of narrow the gap a little bit in between the two so that, you know, we can have, um, you know, drawings that don't have to like sit inside a mat board. Like, and, and I have no, you know, if you're out there and you're framing your drawings in mat boards, you know, that's fine and it's great. Uh, I don't want to like, you know, make, give anybody like guilt about, about doing that. But I stopped, uh, I stopped framing drawings in mat boards maybe, uh, maybe three or four years ago, maybe a little bit longer. There's a framer in, in New York that I used to work with, uh, or still do work with actually, um, Gerald Curian. Uh, runs a shop called Curian Frames, and uh, it does all like kind of handmade, custom work, and uh, it's just beautiful and amazing. And he's somebody who, I think, he always like understood that, you know, the frame needs to like really kind of push the artwork, like uh, you know, push the aesthetic of the artwork. And, and so he's the one that I started working with uh, first where I abandoned uh, the idea of like a mat board. And this is something that, I mean, it's actually, it's not uncommon, I think, among, uh, among New York artists at the moment, you know, realist artists there, um, that they are, a lot of them are kind of dropping the mat board. It's a little bit of a, a modern uh, flair to, uh, to the framing process and Jerry, uh, Gerald uh, was always really, really great about that. So, um, if you ever like, you know, actually I actually had a, a patron contact me the other day asking about like, uh, you know, if you have like kind of challenging frame projects that you you need to like kind of fulfill or you need someone to like collaborate with in a way because really that's what it is with Jerry. Um, who who was it like to go to? And uh, Gerald, of course, was the first one. That, that came to mind. Anyway, but uh, yeah, so I do leave them on the uh, panels. Sampo Peltola is asking, uh, it says, Happy New Year, Stephen, thank you. I was wondering, what in your mind makes a virtuous art student? What are the core qualities one should embody on this journey? This is a really cool question. And of course, you know, my particular feeling about it is gonna be related to Obviously, my experiences as uh, as a student, you know, um, again, which was a long program, uh, physically demanding, mentally demanding, uh, and, and eventually whew, very expensive. But uh, that's just education um, when you're when you're specializing. But I think the quality that I appreciated most in students. And like, I would say actually this probably relates more to my time teaching than my time studying because I don't think I, I could understand this. I could know this really as a student. And maybe even like, I hesitate to say this, but as like a younger person, I'm not sure that I could have really grasped this all that well either. But trying not to run hot and cold, right? Uh, so when I taught Ecorche, right, which is uh, it's a nine month class where you're kind of building the human body from the inside out. You're starting with um, a skeleton and you're building all the way up to the subcutaneous anatomy, which is, of course, that anatomy uh, or those forms and muscles which lie uh, just beneath the skin. So in that class, what happens so often is people would get like really excited about starting it out. Everybody wanted to start it earlier. It was a second year class and everybody would come to me and go, all the students would be like, oh, let me start. Oh, I want to start Equoche now. You know, I've done some anatomy studies and stuff. So I want to, like, I want to do it all now. And, you know, as a teacher, you think, oh, it's great, you know, that they're so excited about it. Um, but what very few people kind of realized is that it is a grind and that excitement that like maybe what you call like hot passion that you have at the start is not the thing that really sustains you. You need to, you need to be the same on the first day as you are on every day. And if you can do that, I think that you can really accomplish a lot. But what would happen so often, of course, is that, uh, is that people would fade 
over time. They would come in really excited and really red hot about uh, about studying the uh, the figure, and then they would realize maybe how hard it was uh, or how time consuming and unforgiving the work was, and uh, they would kind of fade away. So I think it's more of like a disposition thing. Uh, like I said, if you can just bring that same energy every day over the over the, lo the long run, I think that is a quality that um, it never betrays a student, you know, when you're, when you're able to study in that way. It's hard, uh, you know, if you've ever, you know, worked in anything that required that, that kind of like long form discipline, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's not easy. Uh, but that's, that's what I would recommend. So, right, uh, Art A asks, Mr. Bauman, <laughs> Mr. Bauman, uh, I appreciate that, uh, but not totally uh, necessary. Um, sometimes I have trouble recognizing the Terminator and differentiating from some dark mid-tones, even when I squint down any advice. Well, first of all, squinting down is actually not the way to determine the difference in between shadows and, and dark halftones. Squinting down actually uh, tends to reduce the amount of light coming into your eye and as a consequence of that it will tend to kind of unify or push together the, uh, the shadow shape and dark halftone. Uh, so what you want to be doing actually in that instance is kind of opening your eyes up. Now earlier in the, in the stream MJ was asking like what are we missing by not doing cast studies? This is actually one of the things that you really learn uh, uh, like really well studying casts is to differentiate in between the, um, the dark half and the shadow shape. You know, casts are this great way uh, um, or this great kind of um, subject in, in that they have this sort of beautiful pristine white surface and it washes away really any sense of um, like the difficulty that you have like working on the figure a lot of times is actually like the, the color of the skin makes it difficult to kind of understand the, the values that are taking place or it makes it a little bit less, uh, less clear, less crystal clear. And as a consequence of that, you know, that clarity that the cast offers you, you can study very well that particular relationship in between uh, um, shadow shapes and, and dark halftones and things. Let's see, Pamela B is asking, hello Stephen, you're new to your Patreon channel and love your thoughts on the construction center line. Best discussions I've ever seen. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, for those of you out there that are kind of interested in this constructive process, you know, there's a lot of different resources out there and probably every artist is going to have a little bit their different take on, on construction. I mean, in that there are some basics to it, but there's also a lot of idiosyncrasy in it. So rather than, you know, always just showing it through drawing, uh, I put together this lecture series, uh, which is called uh, Drawing, uh, what was it? <laughs> Actually, the center line construction I did right before that, but Drawing Fundamentals. Um, I'm putting together this lecture series of which the center line construction idea is, uh, is among the, the kind of group of ideas that I would, I would consider quite essential to, uh, to being a good drawing student. Um, and uh, Pamela here is, is referencing, uh, yeah, it's about a three hour lecture. Uh, if you want to sample it, of course, there's a, there's a, a shortened version of it, like a 10 minute version of it on, on YouTube, you can check out. Um, and if you wanna see the full thing, of course, just on my Patreon page. Uh, probably most of you that are here, you know that I'm on Patreon, so uh, I don't need to belabor that uh, that point. Um, but if you do want to see it, uh, all you have to do is subscribe to the $10 level, and you have, of course, access to that and like 150 hours or something of other tutorial content. So there it is. Let's see. Um, more questions. Yeah, wow. Yeah, a lot of them. Okay. Hey, so uh, everybody actually just mentioned too, I, I'm going to ramble a lot about these questions. 
partly because like when you're drawing, you know, you kind of, um, well, just what happened just now happens a lot where like you're drawing and talking and drawing and talking and then the part of your mind that's talking uh, takes a break for a second <laughs> because you're focused on something else. And, uh, and so you, you waffle a little bit. So that's going to happen. But um, if I don't get to your question, uh, it's just it's not for a lack of trying. Let's see. Uh, Funut is asking, how do you retain anatomical knowledge? I find myself forgetting a lot of insertions, names, etc. Thoughts on this? You know, it's really so much a... Um, at first, it is repetition. And then it's like fitness. So I think what's important is that you're constantly working with it, which, you know, is, is maybe a little bit of an obvious advice. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't decrease in any way its value. You know, it, it kind of, um, it's something that the less you practice it, the less you work with it, the the less familiar it's going to be to you. So you really need to kind of keep it at the forefront of your mind. Even like as I'm looking over this skull now, you know, I'm kind of thinking to myself, oh, wait a minute, what was the name of that bony point? <laughs> you know, the big ones probably stick with you after a while. Like I've, over the years, I've built about five Echo Shea models and uh, studied anatomy for 10 years or so. And so in a way, like a lot of things are going to stick with me, but you know, inevitably, you know, even if I take uh, some distance from it and I don't, I don't focus on it, yeah, of course, I'm going to, like, forget things. Uh, I think that's quite, probably quite natural. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you're just going to, you're going to keep forgetting them until they become, like, kind of concrete. So, and that's why, you know, for, for my anatomy program, it was always... Uh, making sure that, for instance, like you've drawn the pelvis, you know, like 10 times from different angles uh, and labeled it. Like I was always really big on labeling just because I felt like this is a way that turns something from a um, like a soft skill into something a little bit more accountable. That, that like, yeah, you have you can recite and memorize the names of things just by labeling them. And, and that, that's another like layer of, of knowledge or a layer of like expertise in your, uh, in your approach to drawing. So yeah, I would just say as you draw, like just make sure you're labeling and, um, uh, and after that, you know, it's just a matter of trying to uh, ensure that you don't totally lose touch with anatomical studies. Yeah. I mean, maybe at a certain point, and this is a kind of an interesting thing to bring up, maybe at a certain point, anatomy becomes a little bit less uh, important or less interesting to you. I, I wouldn't doubt that that could happen. I, I mean, over the years, I have spent time being really excited about anatomy, and I've spent time being only relatively excited about it. So it just kind of depends upon your, uh, uh, your enthusiasm. MJ is asking about the uh, more about the mentorship tier. Really, the the mentorship tier is is the most kind of focused type of teaching that uh, that I think you're going to get. You know, even when I taught at the academy, you know, you had about thirty students that you would see in a day, which would mean you probably get to spend about, uh, or actually, well, you'd see them, them kind of twice a day. So you probably spend about let's say five minutes per student per day, which uh, it seems like very little, but um, you've also been like seeing them for, you know, usually a couple of years. So you start to kind of get a rapport with them. You get a way of working down with them. Um, and you're able to kind of communicate a lot uh, in a little amount of time. With the mentorship tier, Obviously, the advantage is that I spend about half an hour with uh, with each student, each each meeting, right? So, and and some students there's a mentorship plus tier as well. Some students I'm spending an, an hour with uh, every month, uh, but it's just a um, a solution to getting really intense 
focused assessment of your uh, of your work and what you need to do to progress uh, usually it, it it winds up being like a um, it usually winds up being like not nearly enough time <laughs> which is not not for lack of trying but you know there's usually so much to say about each individual drawing it's kind of hard to to see if you can get to everything in um, in just that amount of time so let's see uh, someone with a screen name that is a lot of numbers and letters uh, so I'm not going to try and pronounce it is asking are casts something someone can buy for studying totally you can there's uh, actually the place that I get all my plastic casts. So what you can't see is that right behind me on this side uh, is my cast wall um, over uh, over here and uh, I've got them shipped in from uh, from Italy. It's, it's actually it makes it sound like much more expensive than it, than it was. Um, in a way, they're quite reasonable. And there's a guy called uh, Tour. Uh, that's T H O R. Tour Larson. Uh, you can find him on Instagram. Uh, he's a former Florence Academy guy, and um, he makes uh, he's got a great set of molds and um, is really uh, kind of responsible and will get you a, um, a really good kind of uh, sculpture to work from. I'd highly recommend getting them from him because quite honestly like there's a lot of places you can get plaster casts but quality is a massive issue and uh, a bad plaster cast is I mean you're not going to really do a lot with a bad plaster cast. Let's see Fabiano Araujo. Araujo? Uh, it's a Spanish name and I, was, I can't get the J right. Uh, are you going to do a live curriculum for painting too? For sure, man. It totally just, uh, it's totally just about time. I think actually that, I think that the, the live model, so one of the reasons, by the way, um, why I waited a while for the whole live model was I wanted to figure out basically how to do it in 4K. I didn't want to do, I mean, it's fine, it's great and everything, but like, I think a lot of people like do like a lot of live workshops and things like just on Zoom and stuff. And well, I think that's like, okay, you know, this is a visual medium. We kind of need to see things really well. So I wanted to wait until I had the capacity to, um, uh, to broadcast in 4K before I, uh, before I went about like, uh, um, kind of saying I'd put out a class uh, live, uh, but now I feel like I can I can transmit 4K with two or three cameras, and um, so I have that capability. So I think like all my classes now, or all of my uh, my lessons for a while, I think I'm going to start doing live because I think it it definitely gives people, and this is so huge for for those of you that are out there, you know, uh, working and and kind of learning on your own. Um, motivation is such a big deal like uh, you know I talked about the Academy doing like you know six to eight hour days like every every day you know a lot of that is like a massive motivational boost that you get just from being in school right like um, I'm supposed to be there every single five days a week for for six to eight hours a day and if you're not like your teachers know it, and that's that means something. And so I wanted to to find a way also to kind of give that to uh, the students that I work with on Patreon. Is I wanted to give that extra layer of motivation that I feel like is really, I think is really important. So yes, yeah, definitely live painting for sure. Juliana Lindquist is saying hello from Florence. Hello, Juliana. Um, Ol Olbiancini is uh, saying, hey, Stephen, do you know about the artist Dan Thompson? Yeah, Dan's a great guy, yeah. I got to hang out with Dan a bit uh, when I was in New York, did a drawing demo with him at the Salmagundi Club. Uh, really, So really chill guy. And he says, I wonder if you know any other artists who have similar super analytical approach to describing form. I'm very interested in this approach. Yeah, you know, Dan's work, and I love Dan's work, uh, um, I always have. It's, uh, I think, really strong. Um, highly analytical as you say and you know for that reason I think I have you know I feel like a great affinity for in a sense the, the, the way that he works 
Um, but like other artists that are doing things like that, I think that, and you know, Dan has delved, I think, a bit more deeply into um, into this than than even I have. But I think that he's looking at things more in a way that is associated in general in general with um, with like Russian artists and like Eastern artists. And this is not for, uh, uh, not like an aesthetic thing. And then there are Western artists that, that have kind of worked this way. But I think, you know, when you look at the work that comes out of like the Repin Academy and uh, schools like that, uh, I think you see uh, much greater similarity in the way that, that, that Dan works and, and to an extent the way that, that I work. Though it's not uh, anything that I think is... Um, like it's not, I didn't study at the Repin Academy or anything, but it's this idea of basically like a symmetrical kind of block-based structure when, when dealing with human form uh, and using that to, um, to really great effect in terms of like what you're doing, certainly in the early stages of a drawing, but even in some ways like how you're dealing with moving on with a drawing in terms of structure and, and values and things. Um, uh, but like other artists that are doing it, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there, there's there's probably a lot of math that you probably have to search, like you know, search Instagram for him. Juliana Lundquist says, "Where can I buy Casper drawing online?" Look for uh, uh, Tor T H O R sculptor S C U L P T O R on Instagram. That's that's how I I know him anyway. Like, um, uh, so it's Tor Larson L A R S. S-O-N or something like that. Uh, but you can find him on Instagram. And um, uh, and actually, I can say I know like his wife's account, actually, uh, more certainly than I, than I know his. It's uh, Tanvi, T-H-A-N-V-I, Patari, P-A-T-H-A-R-I. Uh, but I'm sure if you contacted her, you'd be able to get to, to him as well. Uh, in any event, that that's where I would recommend it. You're just gonna have to like email him, and um, that's the way it works. Like the ordering is all done via email, uh, and, uh, and then he'll he'll make the the cast for you, send them away, and uh, upon their arrival, uh, you will. Or I was quite happy when I got my cast from him. I, I think they're. Uh, um, it's got a good selection, and the the casts are really quality. The thing is, you need really high quality molds. Uh, and you probably need to be like quite an excellent mold maker as well. Um, uh, you know, it's a whole like kind of set of skills unto itself. And if you're if you don't have those skills, I don't think you're going to do it very well. So like a lot of the stuff you find kind of commercially online is maybe not uh, not particularly amazing. So yeah, Tor Larson. Yeah, there's a couple of people mentioning some cast collections out there. Like I said, I mean, I haven't searched them all, but I would just, I would just be careful. There's plenty of not good cast collections out there. And also, like, frankly, like really overpriced. The other thing about Tours cast uh, uh, prices is that they're, they're very reasonable. Oh, yeah. Oh, someone else, uh, Fabiano, is also mentioning, mentioning uh, Felice Calci, which is um, uh, it's a Roman... Um, a guy who lives in Rome, uh, has an amazing cast collection, and sells them uh, online as well. Uh, so I can definitely um, uh, recommend that. So uh, let's see. John McCullough is saying, core qualities of a student, curiosity, growth, and mindset, enjoyment of problem solving. Yeah, no, these are all things that, um, that are definitely going to, uh, to help you out. Uh, whoa, a bunch of questions coming in. Bronze Rule says, Hi, Stephen, are you going for the 100 skulls? <laughs> We're at 3 out of 10 already. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not going to do 100 skulls, but I'm not saying I'm going to do it either, only because, you know, uh, I can only probably do, like, realistically, a couple of live streams like this a month. Like, the bulk of my time is spent, like, actually making the tutorials that I release on Patreon, so... And each one of those, you know, between filming and uh, editing and stuff, uh, it definitely takes it takes a sufficient amount of time. 
so like to do a hundred skulls, it's kind of like, it's probably a couple years of commitment uh, to do it all via live stream. So, I mean, I don't know if I can like, I don't want to like set that, that for myself. I'll say this though, you know, if all I was doing was, uh, with live streaming, I would, I would definitely do that. Um, just as I believe in that process of, of repetition, you know, if you're able to like repeat, 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 you can get, you can get so far, uh, in terms of kind of like learning what you're, um, what you're trying to do as a, as a drafts person, right? Like trying to figure out how drawing works. You know, I get these questions sometimes, and there was one uh, the other day uh, from a patron uh, or a Patreon subscriber was asking me like, well, how do I hatch on a form? Do I hatch like across the form or like with the form? And while in some ways, like technically there can be an answer to that, it is something, it was never a question that it was answered when I was studying. And, and the thing is, the reason is because it's the kind of question that's answered in the work. You know, it's, it's almost, and, and this is not to, you know, this, this like, there's no such thing as a bad question. It's not that it's a bad question, but it's a question that's answered while you're doing stuff, you know, and, and I don't want to like say, oh, don't ask that question or whatever. But I do want to say it's, if you practice drawing, it is, it will become self-evident to you like how to hatch across uh, across form. Um, so rather than like trying to make a very laborious explanation of it, I would just say just, just you know make sure that you're drawing enough and things like that are going to kind of come to you. Let's see. Hoa Du says, do you have any advice for students portfolios? I'm currently doing it for my college applications. Well, your portfolio is all about your audience, you know, and I think, I think of it, I mean, this is my, I, I never, like, well, I, I did apply, I guess, to the Florence Academy with a portfolio, but it was, they just said, like, send, send your, uh, like, three artworks and, and your contact info, so, I mean, I know that the portfolio process for a lot of people is probably uh, quite different from that, but what I wanted to say was, um, you know, just know your audience, like, uh, in terms of like art competitions and things like, it's not about who makes the best artwork. It's about like who makes the, the artwork that the judges will like best. Uh, and that's not to say you need to like change yourself for a competition. It's just that you need to have, understand your expectations, uh, so that, so that when you, you know, apply to that competition or you apply to that college, you don't, you're not like making one kind of work and just expecting that they're going to love you for, for that. You know, it is about what they want. Uh, so uh, I, I guess just try and kind of know what kind of work is being accepted into that, that college. You know, look at what's on the brochures. Look at, what, uh, look at what their curriculum is, right? Like if you're applying to the Florence Academy and you send, and I remember actually with... Um, uh, there's a teacher I worked with for a while, Simona Dolci, who was the head of the drawing program in Florence. And uh, on some of the days when we were teaching together, she would, she'd be like going over applications. And, you know, there'd be some students that were sending in like this really like conceptual work. And, you know, Simona, or well, I don't want to like tell, I'll just talk about me. In my evaluation of it, uh, my reflection was just that, well, I mean, while that's really like cool and everything, it's just not, it's not really what we do here. So it's, you know, if another student was like sending in examples of their cast studies or something, then we go, okay, well, we can evaluate whether or not the student would work in, in this or like whether this school would do well for them, right? Uh, whereas if, if they're sending in work that that is totally from a different perspective, it's difficult to know whether whether or not they're going to be a fit for that that kind of education. Um, so I just say know your know your audience would be my best um, my best guess. Elizabeth Brown says, "How does anyone remember the name of the down light that Stephen uses to light the models? Can't find it in my notes from last session." 
the light that I recommended for lighting models and and it's a uh, it is a uh, an LED spotlight basically and I, I use that with a uh, soft box as well so uh, it's the aperture light storm 120d mark II, and I use a 36 inch uh, for, for lighting models most times a 36 inch soft box that um, I think uh, I think it's made by a company called impact so so that is my official recommendation for um, for what to use. If Fabiano is asking, are you going to do live curriculum for painting too? Yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to do that uh, in, in time. Um, someone else is asking, I want to chew the graphite down to the base so badly. Um, I'm not sure if that's a question, <laughs> but I appreciate it anyway. Patrick Smith is saying, hi, Stephen, you recommend uh, any anatomy books to go along with Riche? Yeah, I, it kind of depends upon your, like what your focus is, like what you want to be figuring out. But uh, for Echo Shea, for instance, there was always Goldfinger's uh, fantastic uh, Atlas of Human Anatomy. So um, it's an uh, anatomical text by Elliot Goldfinger that is just, uh, it's really, really excellent, really great uh, book, so full of information. And um, also, like I find, like Riche, I find like actually really readable, which, you know, if you've done a lot of like studying uh, various art texts, readability is like such a big deal. Uh, you know, you can have like all the best knowledge in the world, but if it's not like accessible, if it's not readable, uh, it's, a, it's really... It's really quite tough to uh, to get along with. So Riche, I think, manages to make it very readable. Uh, Goldfinger is really just packed, 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 packed with information. Uh, and I, I think because of that also, it's really, um, yeah, it's also really good. So let's see other questions. MJ is asking, can you clarify the goals more on the value and structure stage? Uh, well, value and structure, uh, in a sense, are just about getting your, um, your drawing kind of over this, this is like this intermediate kind of hump where, like actually like kind of where this drawing is right now. It's not quite a line drawing. It's not quite a... Uh, a full value drawing either and I need to like it needs to get a move on and get over from like one stage into the other and so I used to call like the middle stage kind of value and structure just because we need to like progress but the progression can't disrupt like the sense of structure in the drawing so what happens a lot of times when people are like adding values is they're like smudging things around and uh, like smoothing things out which you know it's not really what kind of adding value is about like the value should should enhance the sense of structure and the sense of form and i really wanted to always wanted to kind of bring those two things together always keep those things kind of close in terms of like how I, I think about moving a drawing forward. So when you're working with value and structure, it means that your, your values need to like adhere to the right kinds of planes, right? Structure essentially, what we're talking about is making something believably three-dimensional on the page. If something is said to like lack a sense of structure, it will seem mushy. It will not be believably three-dimensional. Uh, and like I said, you know, I think that the thing, the caution that you take into starting to kind of work with values is, am I adding structure 
or am I just like softening things? If you're just softening things, probably you're you're in for a um, unhappy surprise at the uh, at the end of the working day. So hopefully that that clarifies a little bit the um, the value and structure kind of state as far as a concept is concerned. Let's see. Sampo is asking, what medium do you use to apply an imprimatura to a painting surface? Kind of an interesting question. I used to use uh, like distilled turpentine, but eventually uh, I actually don't use like any solvents anymore. So I actually do my imprimatura just with uh, linseed oil, which in some ways is kind of, um, uh, well, linseed oil, of course, you don't want like a tremendous amount of linseed oil in your lower layers of your painting. Uh, but I, I just, for me, I just don't like to work with any kind of solvent. Like I just don't need that in my life. I don't need the effect of it on the painting. So I just leave it out. And uh, so far it doesn't really adversely affect my painting process or I think the longevity of my paintings very much so I just use a bit of linseed oil very very little and just kind of spread it over the canvas let's see uh, John McKenty is asking where can I purchase the skull that you're using uh, it's from 3M scientific and uh, if you're in the States in the US you can get it on Amazon no problem let's see Hoadu uh, is asking what is your opinion on art school in Norway um, I don't know of any art schools in Norway uh, so, no, I, I, don't, I don't really know. I, I mean, for me, uh, like art schools in terms of like what, what I'm doing, uh, I, I try to just evaluate them based on like what hard skills that they're offering you. You know, even ateliers, you kind of have to look at them and say, are you like an art school? Like, or are you a school or are you like just a place where some very artistic people have kind of come together. And I think that there's plenty of places that, you know, just are conducive to painting. And I wouldn't really say that they're, you know, they're a school with like a structure and a curriculum and, and necessarily like offering too much to, uh, to students. So I'd be aware of that, you know, like, um, we only have like so much time on planet Earth, and uh, I feel like there's very effective ways to learn, and there's less effective ways to learn. And I even, by the way, like even things that I spent time with in the academy, like so when, when I first went to school, you could very easily spend like so we'd go through the Barb program. You start with the Barb program, right? At a certain point in time. The barg was only done when it was judged to be like superlative by an instructor. At the outset, you think, oh, that's like a fine idea, right? Because your standard is excellence. And if your standard is excellence, then the student will like learn to like grasp that standard by, by working with it. Well, that's okay. But like bargs, first of all, are just like a stopgap in terms of learning. Like they're just there to kind of teach you some linguistic features in, in, in drawing. Uh, they're not like, um, for instance, you know, they're not like casts where you're actually deriving the, uh, the shapes and, and translating them yourself. It's vastly different. But what would happen to some students, like going through the BARG program early on, was that you could, if you didn't do like an excellent BARG drawing, you could be on the same BARG drawing for nine months. You could be on the same BARG drawing for a year. Now, obviously that was very rare when it happened, but like, by the way, it did happen. Uh, so that's something that like in my teaching, I try to be like really aware of this, right? Like I'm asking myself, is the time that they're going to spend on this project commiserate with what they're going to learn? And if I feel like 
as with with Barks, for instance, if I feel like you're spending forever with this bark, but the lesson really only is like, hey, this is a shadow shape. I feel like that doesn't match up. And so I, I tend to try to be really crystal clear in communicating, you know, what the utility of the exercise is. If you don't know what the utility of the exercise is, it's kind of hard to uh, maybe pace yourself and understand like what you're supposed to be doing with it. Um, so I actually kind of forgot the question, uh, but uh, that's what happens when you're drawing a bit. Let's see. MJ is asking, I just need to drink some water. MJ is asking, you talk a lot about the hierarchy of values and line quality, but is there such a thing as a hierarchy of design at each stage of the drawing? Less so at like, I guess, each stage of the drawing. Um, I would say that like a hierarchy of design, eventually you could, if you, I'm trying to be like, you know, kind of trying to um, format this in the right way, but you could say that in some areas you are going to be like more detailed than in others. And so that would constitute in a sense like a hierarchy of design. But in general, you know, design kind of refers to like, like everything in a drawing really is a design, you know, or, or a feature of design. So it's not that you're going to not design certain areas or or you're going to pull back on the sense of design in certain areas. So it's, it's hard to call it like necessarily like a hierarchy of design, but I get where you're coming from. Um, and if I, if I was going to say that, yeah, maybe there's, there's something like that, that it would be related to, yeah, like the level of description or detail in one area versus like versus another area. Let's see. Let's see what's happening here. Sorry, so like the questions on YouTube, sometimes they like scroll out like crazy. So like I'll just try and like find the next question and it'll like pop down like 20 questions. So uh, let's see, I just got a little bit lost. Benedict Wendell Dantes asked, do you have any suggestions about drawing anatomy books? Yeah, I was actually just mentioning uh, earlier that uh, Elliot Goldfinger's book on anatomy, I thought, uh, I've always thought, in fact, is is really, really excellent, really amazing um, book. It's so full of, so like dense in terms of information in it. Uh, you know, I think it's a great thing for any student to have. A little bit on the pricey side, but you know, uh, sometimes, I mean, you're going to spend money on stuff. So why not that? You know, that would be, that would be my question. Like, what are you, what are you actually spending the other, you know, $49 on? Uh, that that you couldn't spend on on Elliot Goldfinger's book, <laughs> uh, but that's just uh, you know I mean it's my job so uh, so I mean I, I, these are like just a part of the trade for me um, so I can easily justify kind of spending money on them. Uh, right, um, Jiri uh, uh, Dantier has actually there, so there's apparently this thing on YouTube you can. Um, uh, I guess you can like donate or pay money to people that are live streaming and uh, I think they might have done that here. Uh, so thank you so much Jiri for that. Um, by the way, just side note for everybody watching this, you know, if you do like these live streams, and you like drawing along, the only thing that I'm really asking for is that you just like, subscribe and turn on notifications. Those three things uh, basically just like help grow the channel. And that's, that's, that's really all that I'm doing on YouTube is just trying to like, you know, build up an audience here and offer value to people that are, that are coming through. So if the more people kind of find out about it, uh, the more people I'm able to connect with and that's, um, that's good for me. Uh, and I mean, so far actually the response to um, uh, the live streams has been great. And uh, so I'm, I'm intent upon keeping, to do, uh, keeping doing them. Um, but you can definitely help the effort by just uh, liking and subscribing. I very much appreciate it. Let's see. 
other questions. Kelly Hales says that extra layer of motivation is key. Very true. Very true. Uh, Amagumo Nalumbo says, good morning. I saw your watercolor painting on Instagram and loved it. <laughs> Did you enjoy painting? I love watercolor painting. I really do. I, it's, it's, it's one thing that, you know, it's a medium that I, I have like a great affinity for. Not, I'm not great at it. I mean, I'm, I'm okay, I think. I mean, there's a lot of professional watercolor painters out there that have like a much deeper knowledge about about watercolor than I do, you know? Like, I, I do actually just really, it's one of the few things where I do it just because I love doing it. Uh, like I have no, um, like I don't teach watercolor. I'll probably never teach a watercolor course uh, just because, partly because like it's just a thing that I like to do and so I just want it to stay that way. <laughs> like I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make it a class or a job. Um, uh, I just do it totally as a, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the word uh, dilettante, right? But like in the the nineteenth century, like a dilettante was um, someone that took delight in what they were doing, meaning that they they don't do it professionally. Nowadays, you call somebody a dilettante, it's like um, uh, it's kind of a slight on them, like it's kind of an insult that you're just a dilettante. You're not you're not serious about what you're doing. Um, but in watercolor, I would say that I am very much, uh, as it was the 19th century, I'm very much a dilettante. I just like doing it. Uh, I think it's a beautiful medium and, uh, you know, whenever I have the time, which used to be a lot more, but whenever I have the time, uh, I'll dash off a couple watercolors and, uh, and secretly really, really enjoy them. <laughs> So uh, let's see, Louis Guidetti, uh, who was in Florence when I was in Florence, uh, says looking good. What's up, Louis? Let's see, let's see, what else? Shuvo Art says hello from India, hello to you. Clyde is asking, yo Steven, first of all, thanks for your generous videos. I was wondering if you had a recommendation for places or subjects to sketch from life or practice, I guess it kind of depends upon where you are in the world. Um, yeah, actually follow up on that, Clyde. Just let me know where you are and if there's anything applicable that I can say about that, that part of the world, I'll, I'll definitely give you a heads up. You know, in general, like there's, um, there's plenty of places out there, like in at least like major cities in the US, you can usually find some place that's doing something like this, right? Uh, certainly, if you're in New York, it's the easiest thing in the world to like come across uh, different places to um, uh, different places to kind of study and draw. Uh, a friend of mine, Alex Catlin's always uh, really pushing people towards the Salma Gundy Club, which is one of these old like uh, arts clubs in New York, right? So it's got this building on on Fifth Avenue, a uh, really beautiful building. Um, great collection of paintings in there as well. Uh, also, there's the uh, NAS, the National. What is it? Is it NAS? There's a, there's another arts club uh, also, like right on uh, Gramercy Park uh, in New York as well. Um, they have an even better collection actually than the Salma Gundy Club. Uh, they've got some brilliant, brilliant paintings um, from like 19th century American artists. Uh, but what was that? What was I say? Yeah, like they all host like drawing nights and things like that. And um, yeah, so uh, so this stuff out there, you know, like especially in the states and in major cities, if you're not centrally located like that, maybe you have a bit of a tougher time. But uh, it should be it should be possible to find something. Let's see. Uh, Uggs06 is saying, when do you announce the results of the Rembrandt competition and do you plan on doing more competitions? Yeah, well, yes and yes. Uh, sorry, well, the first question I can't answer yes to because it's not a yes or no question. But the results of the Rembrandt uh, competition that me and Ken Goshen or Ken Goshen and I uh, were hosting on Instagram, uh, yeah, they're coming out really soon. It's just uh, with the holidays and everything, it was a little bit difficult for us to kind of catch up with each other. So uh, I think tomorrow probably will will be uh, 
on Zoom chatting about it, um, uh, about the finalists and everything. And then um, uh, probably Monday, I would say Monday at the earliest, we'll make an announcement on that. Uh, JD Anarchy is asking, how much time do you spend on composition? <laughs> As you can see, actually, in his live stream, uh, not, not much in this instance, in that I should have probably put this skull uh, a little bit further up on the, on the camera. Um, but, uh, you know, in general, I spend, I spend a lot on it. You know, it's um, many ways your, your drawing is probably not going to get like a lot better than the composition is going to allow it to be. You know, um, there's been various like thoughts about that I've kind of been exposed to over the years. Uh, some that I found a little bit less helpful, you know, I mean, like there was this idea at the academy, and I, actually, all right, I full on, I full on hated this idea. <laughs> it's, if you know me, like, it's so rare that I would say anything like that. But this idea that like, um, and, and it's, it comes from somewhere as well, like, uh, and I forget the, the book that this was out of, um, but there was this recommendation about like scale of, of a drawing uh, to a paper that you should maximize the amount of space on the paper that you use. So if your paper is this tall, you should literally make your drawing exactly as tall as, as the paper to maximize the amount of space. I think in general the idea being that uh, because of the, the how much challenge increases as the scale of the drawing increases, you know, the idea of like doing a bigger drawing uh, is essentially like a larger challenge. And so that's kind of interesting for that reason. Well, I think that composition, that what of course, what, what does this do? This gets you into a habit of working essentially without composition. All you're doing is saying, my paper's big, I'll make the drawing as big as the paper is. Whereas composition is essentially, how do we position something inside of this to make it like aesthetically pleasing, you know, and the idea that you would get into a habit of not thinking about that, overtly like ignoring that, it's just, I think it's not wise. I don't think it's a smart idea. Uh, yet somehow it was like a, a, a vaguely popular thing uh, around the time I was at the academy. Uh, I, again, I know that there's another side to this opinion out there, and, and it's historical as well, so it has precedent, but I'm just, I'm not on board. It's just my personal opinion. Let's see. Uh, Jiri Dantier asks, how can I use your Patreon from beginner? Can I use it as a guide or pathfinder? Yeah, so... This is an interesting take in, in that, uh, of course, like all different levels of people uh, eventually are subscribers on my Patreon. So what I, what I did that I think best kind of solves this is that when you go to the navigation site, and if you know Patreon vaguely, by the way, I'll just, I'll just mention, the navigation on, on the like rudimentary Patreon site is abysmal. It's terrible. Uh, so, I actually uh, I hired some developers to uh, actually make a navigation site. So, like all of my Patreon content is actually linked to uh, a website called StephenBaumanArtwork.com. And so, when you're a subscriber, you go to that website actually to use the content on my Patreon page. Uh, it sounds crazy, but if you see the post I made on Patreon, it's it's pretty easy to understand. Um, in that there is a, uh, a, a filters guide, right? So like you can choose beginner content or you can choose intermediate content or you can use like, or choose advanced content. In each of those choices, uh, it will, will come up, of course, like a series of videos that are applicable to that, uh, to that level. Um, and you can use that as a kind of guide to help you understand like, where to be at each stage. I think that the way that people get the most out of my Patreon page, uh, and I think, by the way, um, this is probably pretty true for any 
All right, any of the online stuff that you're going to get out there, right? You can get a decent amount from just watching it, right? You can just watch what's happening and you can go, oh, that, that looks interesting or cool or this is the medium or this is the brush or this is how he or she does that. Uh, and you can get kind of that amount from it. Um, when you actually work along with it, you can get like that much. So all of my tutorials are kind of designed uh, around the idea that you would be working along with the, uh, the tutorial that I'm making. Um, if you're doing that, I think you just want to choose the projects, and that's what I recommend, of course. Uh, you just want to choose the projects you feel like are at your level or you feel like are at your enthusiasm level. Because if you're really excited about something, sometimes that can kind of trump uh, a little bit of your kind of innate ability. It can kind of punch you up a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I think the best way to, to use my Patreon. Certainly is to work alongside it, uh, and, and also within that you want to um, uh, you want to kind of choose your level. I don't want to say choose it wisely, but you know you just want to choose a project that you think fits. So go to the beginning videos if you're a beginner, and do like the conceptual sphere video, like work along with that. And if you're you know uh, into oil painting and, and portrait painting and all that, then of course like go to uh, the numerous portrait painting videos that I have and start kind of working with, uh, with those. Let's see. Uh, Dwayne DeCock is asking, do you ever establish your value range with the darkest areas first? Yeah, I've done that. Um, and it's a very, I think, <laughs> uh, I think it's a very popular way to work. Uh, online in that it kind of makes the first uh, 15 minutes of the drawing like really exciting and you know that's that's uh, fine but um, and I, I it sounds like so much like I'm throwing shade on that I, I don't mean to like it's really literally totally cool and uh, a lot of artists do that and there's totally nothing wrong with that it's just not my particular process my particular taste I like linear structure, I always have, uh, and I kind of believe in that so much, like as a part of design, that I, I kind of like to uh, develop things in a slightly different way. I feel like I have maybe more control when I'm developing in a certain, in a certain way. And I also feel, all right, this is where, this is, I'm going to put, put myself on the line out there. I'm also going to say I think developing things with linear structure more so than just bashing in a lot of values, I think your drawing actually has a higher ceiling in terms of uh, eventually the execution of it. Now, that is gonna be subjective, I get that, and um, uh, the difference in the ceiling maybe is not so extreme, but I think for me, it's noticeable, uh, commonly noticeable, and so I feel okay kind of putting it out there and, and saying that that's, that's what I think. Uh, not true in all cases, uh, but you know, a lot of times, yeah, I think uh, students students could do well to study linear structure. That's my opinion on the matter. Funut is asking, any place to get educated on painting for self-taught artists? Well, there's plenty of places. I mean, that's yeah, there's there's as many places probably as there are uh, people out there. Now, this wasn't always the case. You know, back in, oh man, did I just say that? All the way back in 2003, when I was, you know, uh, looking at kind of finding a place to figure out how to do this stuff, there were probably five schools in the West, like, you know, counting Europe and, and the US, where you were properly going to study realism. And I was only aware, <laughs> I was only actually aware of one of them. <laughs> so uh, that's where I applied and that's where I went. I later discovered there, were, there of course, were a couple others uh, where you could go, like the Angel Academy and Charles Cecil School and things. And, um, you know, that were available to, uh, uh, to apply to at the time. I simply just hadn't heard of them. I, I just had heard of the Florence Academy. And so that's why I applied there. Um, 
And I'm glad I did. I'm glad I, I went to Italy to study. Probably because, and I'm, I feel like probably a lot of my audience is in the, in the U.S. Uh, if, yeah, I mean, I know, by the way, there's also like a lot of people in other countries as well. So, uh, you know, I mean, whether or not this applies, I'm, I'm not sure. But like where I was from in the U.S., like there wasn't really like a lot of history. I'm from Miami, by the way, like originally. And, and this is, uh, <laughs> since you guys are all out there like listening to me talk, I'm sure this has occurred to you. Like, where does this guy's accent come from? It doesn't come from anywhere. There's just not a thing about it. It's just like, I've always sounded like this and that's how it is. But um, what I was saying was where I was from in Miami, like there's not like a tremendous amount of history that is focused on like the period in history that I was interested in. Uh, and so going to Italy for me meant that I was actually able to engage with that kind of history that, that was most interesting to me, you know, and, uh, and it's huge. It's such a big, it's such a big thing uh, to, to be able to do. Even if you're from like the Northeast in the States, I feel like you have the opportunity to go to the Boston Public Library and see the Sargent murals, to go to the MFA in Boston and see the Sargent paintings and the, uh, the Mancini paintings and every, everything else that kind of happens there. You know, you have all these opportunities and uh, I felt like in Miami I didn't really have those and uh, so uh, getting out and going to Italy was really like a game changer for me, life changer for me. It, I mean, well, also, by the way, I met my wife there, like, you know, I kind of uh, became who I am, I think, when I, when I was living there, I kind of grew up a bit. So, uh, the question was, <laughs> this is me forgetting the question, um, ah, any, any place to get educated? Yeah, man, there's, there's so many, but don't like, uh, also like, don't sell yourself short, you know what I mean? If you can get out there in the world, you know, it's not a bad idea. I'll say that. MJ is asking, how many hours should we spend working on a portrait drawing as students? Cool question. Uh, because I also think it kind of relates to, you know, something I was saying about Bargs earlier. Uh, and it is that, like, sometimes you're just not really, like, you could spend a lot of time with a drawing or painting kind of not progressing because you're not really ready to progress. You have like more stuff to learn in other areas. Uh, so I'm a big, like I, I believe a lot, you know, in, in kind of like setting deadlines for yourself and things. I just think it's like a healthy kind of way to go about it. So I would try to think about it in terms of like sessions. When you're working from life, it's a lot easier because you have like model sessions that you can rely on to uh, like use to kind of make sense of things. Um, like when I was a, when I was a student, for instance, like you'd spend if, if you're doing like your first portrait, I think you'd probably try and spend about about ten sessions with the model, which was uh, like three hours a session. So you'd figure like thirty hours on a portrait. I think in some ways it's actually excessive, uh, not because you can't spend that, that amount of time on a portrait, but it's like probably by 15 hours you've done, you've done just about everything that you understand to do uh, and, uh, and also like probably spend some time wandering around, which I think is actually really good for a student. You want to spend that time wandering around. You want to spend time like doing stuff you haven't done before. So my like generic suggestion would be like around 15 hours. But that kind of depends upon your, your level. If you're, um, if you're quite advanced, uh, I could see spending more time than that just because, you know, it's, it's about like how much effective time you're spending really. It's not about like literally just how much, how much time, but I think like generically, you know, a uh, beginning drawing student uh, could spend 15 hours on a drawing and and be productive like the entire time So that's what I would recommend Right questions questions And uh, let's see The rock asks 
brother, and I wonder if you like doing a rock impression here. Brother, any thoughts on Scott Robinson, how to draw a book? I actually don't know the book, sorry. Um, but I will Google it eventually. Uh, let's see. Bippin Shres... Oof, that's a tough name to pronounce. Shres Shrestha asks, how should someone structure art training for self-study? <sighs> wow. No, I mean, it's a great... I, I, I exhale because it's, it's a very useful question, uh, obviously. And I, I think there's a lot of different... Uh, obviously, a tremendous amount of like different takes. Uh, I think that it does depend a little bit on your personality type. Um, but I can tell you some things that I believe are important for self-study. One, and if you've like watched some of these streams before, you might you've probably heard me say this, but one of the important things is you got to give yourself the time with the subject matter. Uh, you know, the real difficulty, I think, studying by yourself uh, is that you have so many different, like, options. You have so many different, like, study options. You know, you can jump to this course and that course and from this artist to that artist, and there's no end to the amount of, like, variety in terms of, like, what you can what you can engage with. Uh, so part of your difficulty is just going to be like narrowing yourself down, like narrowing your focus, right? Uh, once you've kind of narrowed your focus a bit, then you need to like spend the time to actually digest and engage with the material. Uh, so once you've done those two things, I think you have a great opportunity to kind of grow. But let's say I'll just, you know, whatever, like, take one of my courses as a for instance like if you sign up to my patreon and you uh you start out a project uh, i would say like you listen to some of the lecture series and then move on to actually like working on one of the projects uh, i would say give yourself like at least probably five drawings with with those concepts before you say like, oh, I'm going to just move on to the next thing, whether that's another artist or the next set of tutorials, whatever it is, um, you just have to give it time because a lot of your learning is going to be about like repetition. So you need to like repeat all these tasks over and over again to kind of get them, to get them right. Uh, and that's, I think, part of the part of the difficulty is that while you're doing that, you're also facing this tremendous amount of resistance. Now, resistance comes in a lot of forms. You know, uh, simply put, it's just what makes it difficult for you to, like, kind of continue. And, and if you're into, like, exercise and stuff, you'll know this, like, you know, about, like, jogging or something. What's the resistance? Well, it's not fun to jog. Like, I mean, it can be, uh, what's the word? Um... Uh, rewarding but like I don't find jogging fun uh, I do it because I know like it's about fitness and I will get I will feel better for having done it so the the resistance is it's boring uh, and the uh, the reason I do it is because I, I look for the kind of the long-term benefit um, and I think like with drawing and painting it's, it's very much the same like you know it's hard to you know, get all the stuff, the gear together, you know, get away from all your obligations in the world and like really just kind of focus on, on drawing and painting. Uh, that's challenging to do. Uh, so that's kind of the, the resistance. I think that your, um, uh, yeah, your regimen for self-study um, has to involve like some kind of uh, objective routine where you're not just kind of relying on like when you're inspired or when you're excited uh, to, to do it because uh, I think eventually those things will, will not work all the time. And that's what you need. You need like consistent effort and consistent pressure over time uh, to kind of get better at this stuff. Hope that makes sense. 
By the way, I'm, I'm probably drawing a, a skull too big for me to, uh, um, to like finish up during this live stream. Um, but we'll see, uh, we'll see how far I go. Um, maybe the next skull is uh, smaller. Let's see. Uh, awesome, Picelli is asking, I focus primarily on longer 30 plus hour drawings as a result. My quicker sketch drawings have always been turned out horrible. <laughs> this is like a really, really interesting point and something that I certainly discovered uh, as, a, as a student. Um, I was always, of course, at the academy focused on these really long form drawings that I would do in like really super optimal studio environments. And yes, when I graduated, my ability to sketch was terrible. It was awful. It was abysmal. What you come to find out is that they're just different skills. Uh, like sketching is a different skill and it requires you know, the same amount of like time and focus that you spent doing this other thing. Well, well guess what? Like you got to spend that on, on figuring out how to, to sketch as well. So um, I would just say to you that that you, you probably you just need to kind of re first like accept that that's the case then you kind of just have to reinvest and uh, make sure that you're um, uh, focused on something different so my problem I think when I was kind of going from working on these long form drawings into sketches was that with sketching you need like more information early on um, to kind of get the proportions and things settled. If you're doing a drawing that takes like a lot longer, you can, you just have like a lot longer for the, the drawing and the accuracy to kind of develop. If you're sketching, like that has to be done like yesterday. Uh, so there's a premium on kind of getting, um, getting things uh, on the page and started fast. And that was so contrary to my usual methodology uh, that, that that was like, I think the compromise for me was that I, I didn't, I just didn't have enough on the paper fast enough, I think, to, to sketch very well. Uh, so, so yeah, like I think what I recommended to students, you know, at the academy that were, uh, I think, facing like a similar difficulty because they had studied a similar way to me, um, was to go through this phase where you draw like almost without um, without digestion. You just go and you just throw everything that you see onto the paper fast. And you're gonna do that for a while and it's gonna like probably kind of suck. But eventually you're gonna get used to, I think, living in and, and working in a little bit more of a chaotic state. And, and that I think is where sketching kind of lives for me. It's a little bit more of a chaotic thing and you can learn to like love that chaos or not or you can learn that you don't like to sketch <laughs> one of the two <laughs> uh, right so Rose Paradiso says uh, can you talk about Roma paper do you still use it what can you say about how you learn to blend to create transitions so Roma paper is this very particular kind of uh, um, make of paper that was used uh, certainly at the academies in Florence and it was prized because it held value really really well um, like if you've ever worked in charcoal you understand that like there's only so much of it you can like get onto the paper actually and uh, uh, and then also like erasing you need like a really you need a really tough paper, actually, to be able to kind of stand up to all the erasures of like a 75 hour drawing. Uh, well, Roma paper ticks those boxes. Uh, and so this is like the reason why it was really, really appreciated. Um, incoming students, however, <laughs> generally hated Roma paper. <laughs> like I know I did. I was like, what is it? Like it, it, it's almost like corrugated cardboard uh, Roma paper. It's um, very difficult to initially get a handle on uh, because we're so used to like wanting to refine things and make things like nice and smooth and stuff. 
And that is not what Roman paper is about. Uh, Roman paper is about like broadening your focus uh, and kind of zooming out and trying to get like a big picture sense of things. Uh, and that is, I think, why the transition to it is very hard initially. Um, but then also like once you figure out, ooh, like that broadened focus, that's kind of interesting. Like that's not something I've done before. Uh, that's something I can kind of work on. Then it becomes like something you appreciate eventually. Now, here's the true test, right? Do I use Roma paper now? No, I don't. But I also don't draw in charcoal now. Uh, or like in general, I don't draw in charcoal. Um, I mean, there's the odd time. I certainly don't draw in, in vine charcoal exclusively, which is what we did with, uh, with Roma paper. Uh, you draw with, um, with vine charcoal uh, for you know a long, 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 75 hours on a drawing. Um, and because of that Roma paper was great. But in the intervening time, now like if I use charcoal, probably I'm gonna use uh, um, probably I'm gonna use like compressed charcoal just because I prefer the kinds of effects that I can get with that. Um, not because it's better or worse, I just like the effects I can get with it. Uh, so my advice to you, it sounds like maybe you're uh, studying at one of these schools. So if you are studying at one of these schools, uh, you know, just learn to love the good parts of it and, uh, and kind of move on from there. You won't have to use it for the rest of your career, but um, it is like instructive in one sense. Like it will get you to like uh, kind of broaden your focus instead of kind of being so worried about like kind of tightening things up all the time, which is um, maybe a challenge that some students will face is that they associate like drawing with just like tightening things up all the time it's all about like how neatly can i render something but like the reality is you know drawing is i think best when it's when it's broad uh when it's big in that in that way so that would be uh the best advice i think i could give about that let's see what's next uh, MJ is asking, what have you learned from Sargent? You know, it's interesting. Sargent is like a great painter for like studying painting. And that sounds like I'm kind of diminishing his importance. Um, well, I mean, the, the, just the raw answer to the question is so many things like, uh, you know, if you want to learn about being, um, what's the word, like, uh, being efficient in your work, uh, Sargent is fantastic for, for, like, showing you that. If you want to learn to, uh, um, like, study color and value really well, Sargent is fantastic for that. If you want to learn to, I mean, the list could just go on and on. Uh, so, I mean, there's innumerable things that you can uh, that you can learn from Sargent um, if you uh, if you study him uh, but for me I think one of the things that I that I like about about Sargent and that I continue to kind of study in Sargent um, is the way that he was able to uh, understand what was essential and focus on that and not like all the, all the nonsense, because there's plenty of nonsense. Uh, there's plenty of things that don't really affect what you're doing, and they're easy to get caught up in, and uh, Sargent was having none of that. Uh, so that's what I always liked about, um, about him. He's very essential. Let's see. Uh, Kumari Butathoki is asking, after a unified value and separating the shadow and light, how do you go about adding the value? Do you see the darkest and lightest and go? Or do you shade the darkest shadow and afton? No, not really. It's, I, I, what I tend to do is that um, I like to, to work from the middle out. Uh, so rather than like just uh, like establishing the darkest dark and the lightest light, I kind of tend to work with like mid-tones and mid-tones and mid-tones and mid-tones and then the last thing I usually put in is like the darkest values. 
Um, it's something that uh, actually, oddly enough, uh, that that you get when you study Sargent. Um, this was very much his painting technique was to work from the, the kind of middle out. And so I've kind of adopted that in my uh, drawing process as well. Yeah. So that's how I build up the, uh, the values or choose to kind of build up the values. Let's see, CCC is asking, I wonder when I should use the blending stump when I'm cross hatching an object. It's fine, but I lose control using the blending stump to blend. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just a, one of those things a little bit down to feeling. Um, you know, some teachers will outright like just say, no, you shouldn't use it. I'm not one of those teachers. Uh, I've always felt like, and by the way, like it's not even, this isn't even me, like there's precedent for this in the 19th century. Like you, you were recommended to use a stump because it was a lot more like painting than, than just cross hatching. Uh, in certain schools, I wouldn't say in every school, but it's not like we're like making it up, like we're finding a reason to use the stump, like people used them in the 19th century. It's one of the reasons they still exist. And I just feel like drawing tools, like it's all about like how you use them. If you use a stump and you're like super efficient, like why on earth would I say like don't use that? Uh, you know, I, I use a stump and I think I'm pretty efficient with it, but you gotta you got to go by feeling. You got to figure out when you can and when you can't, what kind of effect you're trying to get. You know, that's the other thing. Is I think that, that people maybe are using stumps to do like the wrong thing with it. Like stumps aren't actually there to, to like model form. If you like stump to create a transition, you're just going to make something like really soft and like rubbery looking, which is, uh, which is not obviously in the spirit of like a skull that we're making, right, for instance. Uh, so you just kind of got to know a little bit what you're trying to get to and you got to respect that. And if you do, the stump can be great. Uh, but that takes some getting used to. And that, that's, that's the thing too, is I think it's one of the reasons why teachers will recommend against it is because you can use it wrong. <laughs> But as I say that, like you understand, like eventually you probably will use it. And I think you really only get good at stuff by doing it. So I say use it and figure out how to use it the right way. Because eventually you're going to find it useful. That's my, like, it's my hot take. Just use a stump. Get over it. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Uh, you know, there's so much other stuff to like, kind of worry about other than like, can I use a stump or not? You know, I mean, um, you know, let's talk about structure. Let's talk about planes. Let's talk about so many other things other than like, and this is not to the person asking the question. This is to like art teachers, uh, you know, and I, by the way, this is like to art teachers that I had too, like that, you know, told me, oh, don't blend or don't use a stump or don't do this. So many other subjects to worry about. Talking about don't use a stump. Anyway, um, yeah. So uh, yeah, a couple of people are asking about the perspective. Yeah. So this is viewed kind of from the side. Like the camera is not is not here. Like looking right at me. The camera is like off to the side. Uh, so there's a bit of perspective here. Like so this is going to look a lot more thin than what uh, what that one over there looks like. Yeah, Hoadu is asking, how do you catch up with old projects? You know, sometimes you just don't. <laughs> sometimes, you know, if, if the momentum leaves you, sometimes that's it. And you just have to let it go. There's plenty of projects that I've uh, started and, and not finished. Um, you can't kind of fake what it takes to like finish a drawing or a painting. You know, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of like commitment. It takes a lot of creativity. It takes a lot of like time and energy. And if you if you're not like 100% on about the project, you're not gonna have those things. And so you're not gonna finish it well. At, and at that point, well, why would you? Like, 
in painting and drawing, there's only, let's say uh, as a professional, maybe make that stipulation. As a professional in painting and drawing, there's only finishing it well, uh, because like an average work or a bad work doesn't like, it doesn't go anywhere. It's, you're not going to sell a bad painting. Uh, so, or at least you're not going not to sell a painting that, that looks like you weren't really interested in doing it. <laughs> so if you have the enthusiasm, go all the way. If you feel that enthusiasm waning, uh, you can wait until it comes back. Uh, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, hopefully that doesn't sound too, uh, uh, I don't know, discouraging. I don't want to be discouraging, but it's like, I just, it's just something I notice about, uh, you know, I know myself when I'm working, like if I don't have that excitement, uh, I'm not going to do a good job, you know, that's just how I've always been. Um, and that can be, by the way, that, that can be a, a hard thing to, um, uh, to accept, you know, uh, as you pour all these hours into a project and then nothing comes out of it. It's one of the hardest things in painting or the hardest things about like being an artist is, is that, uh, you can very much be investing tons of time and effort into something and then nothing can come out of it. And that's tough. Of course that's tough. Everybody would have a difficulty with that. Let's see. Uh, questions. Sorry, yeah, like a bunch of questions come in and so like the scroll went really, really uh, far away so I gotta find it. Yeah, someone's asking if I'm working uh, from the skull or from a photo of the skull. I'm working with the same image that you guys have on screen. Uh, which, by the way, I hope you're all, I hope, I hope, I hope that all of you are out there drawing with me. The whole reason that I want to do these live streams is so that people get an excuse to like make sure they sketch and think about sketching and think about drawing on a regular basis and just get those hours in because, you know, eventually like it takes a long time to get good enough at this stuff uh, that, that you kind of um, are, are an expert. Uh, and because of that, you need, you just, sometimes you just need to put in the hours. Um, and so I thought, well, if I can give people like an excuse to go out there and, you know, spend a couple hours drawing, then, then I think that's like a really good thing. Uh, and that's what I kind of wanted to do with these. So, uh, if you're here, it's great. If you're here and you're drawing, I think it's even better. Uh, and that is what, what I hope all of this stuff uh, does. Jean-Michel Feit is saying, you and I draw in a very similar way. I use a lot of chiaroscuro. I do my darkest, uh, first great value in structure, um, uh, but are also in delinear structure. What are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that, um, I think that in general, you know, of course, well, the whole reason like that, that chiaroscuro, like, or light and dark, you know, or, or such a, a light and shadow uh, are so effective uh, is because they're, this is the way that we kind of perceive the world. This is very, uh, a very kind of useful lesson for, for artists is that, um, you know, it, it's easy to create a big impression with like a big kind of value statement. Uh, and so, of course, you have to, if you're going to learn about representation, it means you're going to learn about, uh, about chiaroscuro. Um, but then, like, uh, you also eventually, I think you want to, you want to know different ways to kind of approach things, you know, because, you know, for me, versatility is, is what I always wanted. Uh, I always wanted to be able to draw in this way or that way or really in whatever way um, suited the subject that I was working on, you know. Uh, whereas if like you, for instance, if your painting is all about like light and shadow, well then you're always going to need a studio or a subject in which that's the case. And as you go out into the world, you're going to realize like less and less places have exactly that configuration that suits the way that you study. Uh, or the way that you, you, you started to work. 
Now, of course, part of being an artist is like making the environment that, that is conducive to that. Uh, so, um, so you don't just, you're not just like a victim of circumstance and you just do whatever comes. Uh, you do want to like create the environment uh, that, that kind of suits your needs. Uh, but at the same time, you want to be able to choose what those needs are. You want to be able to choose like what, uh, what you want to achieve visually. And, I, and that, that for me was always a really big motivator. Uh, so I didn't want to be like uh, tied into you know, having to work with a particular kind of lighting situation. But that, you know, again, that's, that's, you can hear, of course, as I say, that's a, just a personal choice. Um, you know, I think it can be very useful, uh, certainly professionally, to just, like, pick a lane and stick with that lane, you know? Um, pick a lighting situation and just stick with it. And as a professional, a lot, I mean, that's, that's what, it, you know, what I had to do as well. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway. That's my thoughts on it. Let's see. Uh, not now is asking, is it okay for a beginner to learn from tracing or copying? The, uh, the best take that I ever heard on stuff like this was actually from Loomis's book on, uh, I think it's on heads and hands. Uh, but he talks about like, like what basically what your purpose is for learning. Like if you're you know, going into commercial drawing and painting, like you're a commission artist, uh, where, you know, likeness is 90% of the job. He says that, yeah, basically, like, probably you should be tracing because, like, you know, if you, if you don't, if you get it wrong, like, you're not doing anything. Uh, and he was just looking at it from, like, a practical perspective, you know, um, and he went on to say also that like if you love drawing and your passion is drawing and you just want to learn to like sketch and draw heads really well, then you should probably learn to construct because that's what's going to get you to that destination. So I guess my question to you would be, well, what do you want to do? If you want to make money as a commission artist, uh, probably you can you can learn that way. I mean, why not? I mean, it's it's a practical way to do things. Uh, if you want to um, learn to faithfully like draw and paint the figure um, from direct observation, uh, then no, you're never going to get there by tracing stuff. So, yeah, it just depends on what you want. Um, I, I I don't I don't feel really like moral about a lot of this stuff either. Like you know, uh, some artists get like really caught up in like whether it's right or wrong or whether you're allowed to paint this way or paint that way like I just feel like drawing and painting it's is not really for me it's not really the place for people telling you like you can or can't do something you know um, it should be probably more about what what you want than uh, than necessarily like what's uh, what's like allowed um, in that in that endeavor, if that makes sense, um, and I'm someone like I, you know, I'm a big believer in tradition, and uh, uh, you know, it's not it's not that I want to like tear down the establishment. I just again, I just feel like there's a reason that you're doing this stuff, and and that that has to be a part of it. You got to understand like what that reason is. So hopefully that's not uh, uh, or that doesn't confuse things further. Hopefully that. Clarifies a little bit. Let's see. Uh, Camilo Rodriguez is asking, Stephen, what should be the relationship when drawing figurative between drawing what you're seeing and idealizing to nail the likeness and improving the subject? Well, hmm. This is a cool question, um, but I'm a big fan of questions that don't have like... Uh, Yes, no answers. I think in general, I probably tend to like want to split the difference. In general, I, I tend to think like, I just want to be able to choose like what the, the most 
pleasing version of this subject is for me. Now, that implies that if a completely unerring and totally faithful version of the subject is what I find most pleasing, then I want to have the technical skills to be able to, to do that. If what I find is most pleasing is a very interpreted version of that, of that reality, I also want to have the skills to do that. So, uh, I think that, one, you want to be able to answer the question, are you doing it because you want to, or are you doing it because you have to? And after you have answered that question, uh, then uh, I think you can start to, um, uh, to talk about improvement. Uh, my general feeling is that there's, I, well, I'll tell you what, in my work, like I don't tend to, you know, think about necessarily improving. Um, you know, I might, I might, like I said, think about what is, uh, what is the version of this that I believe appeals the most to me and then work outward from there. Uh, but all of it is like also so process driven. Like I'm drawing, this is like partly the way I draw and this is partly what I like about the subject. You know, uh, as I work more and more and more, the drawing will become more and more and more like what I find interesting and what I find meaningful and what, I, what I'm attracted to. Uh, but also at a certain point, it's like it's just a product of like how I'm looking at the subject as well. Like, you know, I'm looking at this in terms of like a linear substructure with um, you know, a strong basis of like value application uh, that, that is kind of floating a little bit over that. So the drawing really can't be something other than, other than that. And this is an interesting thing too, and I say this to students like over and over and over, like what you train as, that's what you're going to draw like. Uh, you know, the, there's this idea out there that like, I've heard among like realist painters, or, or at least you, know, you kind of see happen a little bit, is that people will go and like study representational painting like this, and then go like, but I want to be a concept artist. And it's like, well, that's like a totally other skill set. Like that's, that's like night and day. Um, and sure, there's going to be some overlap. I mean, it would be crazy if you say there's no overlap. But there's also like a lot of kind of like really different challenging stuff that you're going to have to face if you're going into this, uh, this other, um, other endeavor. So I say, you know, you got to train in what you want to be, you know, um, and that can be hard because maybe you don't know exactly what you want to do, but, uh, that's why talking about it, I think is, is also really, uh, really useful. Let's see, Jean-Michel Fate is saying, I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida, by the way. Uh, and as the second question, what would you recommend a full-time artist who needs more exposure and expanse? Um, I would say that uh, exposure today is very different from exposure 10 years ago. Uh, and like most of you probably know me just just numerically most of you probably know me from Instagram uh, that's a platform where I'm, I'm really active um, which like again like 10 years ago I mean people used it but it wasn't really a thing in the way that it is now and uh, I think that 10 years ago, it was probably very difficult for artists to have some kind of exposure and kind of get out there. Um, but depending on like how you want to do it, uh, like if you wanted to do it on social media, and I've been thinking about this lately too, like I don't know if I'll ever commit to this fully, but the idea of actually putting together like an Instagram for artists course, I, I think is would probably be really useful to people because it's, it's, it's not rocket sciences, or it's not rocket science. There's a few things that you have to do, um, but if you do them, you're kind of virtually assured to like build an audience. And, 
And if that's what you're meaning by exposure, uh, then, um, like I said, there's some really just uh, basic fundamental stuff that you need to do. Starting with, you need to have a, um, a content model, uh, which basically is a kind of a version of, of what value do you have to offer people? Uh, because eventually, people are there not necessarily for you, they're kind of there for themselves. And this can be a hard thing, I think, for a lot of artists to grasp. And, you know, you see people, you know, um, going out there and like kind of putting out content, but the content is all like me, 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 me. It's all like kind of look at how cool I am. And if you're like really, really, really cool, you can get, you can like kind of create a bit of a following that way. Uh, but if not, you know, it can be in a way quite, uh, quite limiting. Um, but anyway, like this is, it's kind of a long, uh, long roundabout thing to kind of get to, but um, basically kind of decide what you have to offer, figure out what you have to offer. It doesn't have to be the most profound thing in the world, but you just have to offer people something. Uh, and then offer them that consistently over time. Uh, if you can do those things, then you can gain exposure, you can have an audience, you can do a lot of things. Uh, let's see. Sapana Adhikari is asking, how do you self-study from an anatomy book? Do you copy the images? Do you memorize the images? Can you recommend an organized way to learn? Ooh. Well, you know, I mean, like, truth is probably the answer to that question is deeper than I can really go to here. Um, there's a book that I think offers what to me is the most like effective version of like, you know, anatomical study out there. And I, I have it over on my bookshelf. I might actually just pop up and grab it and, and kind of show it to you guys. Um, because I think it's important to study anatomy in context. Uh, you know, which is to say that when you're drawing or painting the nude figure, they have skin and they have fat. So they don't look like necessarily what Richet's, uh, uh you know, flayed figures look like. I mean, for sure they don't. So you want to get used to making a correlation in between like the theoretical knowledge and then like the practical knowledge of, of like what does this look like when I'm drawing it on an actual human. Uh, and there was a book that actually encompasses this that I, I never really knew about <laughs> till long after I had really kind of made up my mind about this. This is one of those kind of nice moments where you kind of get a confirmation, um, like an independent confirmation of something you were thinking about uh, by someone who's really smart. And so... Uh, I was very, I was very pleased to to find that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab the book. I'm gonna go grab it right now. I'm gonna show it to you on camera. Just give me one second. So it's this book by uh, Arthur Thomas, um, and you can see what he's doing here. Uh, it's actually what he does throughout the book a lot, is that he'll take the, uh, the human figure like in a photograph and he will overlay basically the subcutaneous anatomy uh, that, that you would find there um, and attempt to understand the, uh, the figure through that. So um, I don't know if I can actually like flip through this. There's kind of nudity in it and I don't want to get like flagged by YouTube or whatever. Uh, but uh, this is a great book. I, w I highly recommend it just in terms of like I said, it's kind of practical value. It's, it's studying anatomy, but it's trying to do it in a way that is not just theoretical, because if you, if you just study the theoretical, um, it won't, it won't necessarily like make it into your drawing. And, and you'll hear me kind of use this language a lot. Uh, like it needs to be in your hands. Like uh, you're learning a craft. And it's like if you're a basket weaver and you're like, I've read all the books on basket weaving. Like, I totally get it. 
and you like haven't woven a single basket. Like you don't know anything actually. <laughs> so you need to um, you need to make like a practical approach to uh, anatomical study, and that's going to happen certainly through drawing, uh, but also I think uh, not just through drawing the diagrammatic models of the figure, but uh, also through uh, trying to draw anatomy kind of in situ is, is what I would call it. So I hope that uh, that helps in terms of like you know, crafting, and this is where I was saying, like, I don't know if I can, like, say all this here, but in terms of, like, giving yourself a practical plan for anatomical study, you know, the, I mean, that's, that's a long, that's a really long form question, because you start to talk about, you know, comprehensive study then, um, rather than, like, anecdotal study, which is, probably the way that like most people take in anatomy is they they just like, you know, I'm drawing the head, I'll find out about the skull or, um, you know, I'm drawing the, the figure, I'll find out about like, uh, what does a standing leg look like or whatever, you know, so um, that's the, the brief answer that I can give you. The other maybe it's a bit too in depth. Let's see, Max is asking, <laughs> and labels it with a Q for question. Uh, for beginning art students, would you suggest only doing longer drawings, uh, quick sketches, or a mixture of the two? Uh, that is an easy answer because it is uh, a mix of the two. And uh, I would actually also recommend the kind of time frame of those uh, because uh, quick is not the same in every... Uh, evaluation of it. So I think that eventually uh, my a version of my quick drawing would be like a couple hours like this. This for me is quite a quick drawing considering that uh, a lot of my drawings I will take between like 9 and 12 hours on and this one I'll be taking uh, probably actually have to be wrapping up soon. I have to make dinner. I'm sure my wife is like very hungry. Uh, and she's relying on me to uh, uh, cook dinner for her, so um, so I won't be much longer on this. But this this for me would be effectively a fairly quick drawing. Uh, I know that probably it doesn't seem like it, uh, but yeah, like two to three hours. I think I was relatively quick, and uh, then of course you know like a longer drawing being you know in the nine to twelve hour range. I think that's also a uh, very kind of useful metric to um, to use to kind of judge where your, your drawing should be at at a certain stage. Right, there's a lot of questions and definitely not as much time. Uh, so I'm going to, by the way, like people in the comments, if you just say anything political, like just get out of here. Like it's not it's not the place for it, so just don't do it. Um, right, uh, questions, let's see, MJ is asking, do you squint down when looking for subtle shapes in the lights and designing them? I kind of squint down now like all the time like out of habit. Probably the place that I don't squint down is like when I'm looking for in general, like anatomy and structure. Uh, usually, all right, so here's the thing, when you're squinting down, you're looking at values. Uh, it's for kind of a value impression. Um, but my feeling is that, like, probably you should, like, looking for form and structure and things, for me, are, like, highly intellectual. I'm not going to say that they're totally abstract and it doesn't involve, like, looking at the subject, but uh, it involves like kind of knowing what you're looking for in the subject and then finding out exactly where it is. Uh, hopefully that's helpful. I know it's a little bit of kind of an abstract way to uh, answer a question. Uh, but, but in general, no, like I'm not really uh, squinting down to find, uh, to find shapes like in the light. Squinting down is more uh, assessing the value choices that I made and seeing if I, I kind of basically did them right. If I, if I got them right, 
uh, the impression should be good when I squint down. If I didn't do them right, the impression is probably not good. By the way, right now I'm just like working on the, the big forms of the, of the head. Like probably all I'll be able to get to in the rest of the stream is just like kind of a basic organization of the structure of the head. I'm not really going to be able to make a drawing too well. Uh, Juliana Lindquist is, or Lind Lindquist is saying, what's that thick pencil you're using? I don't know um, which one you mean. Uh, <laughs> but these are uh, basically two kind of pencils I'm using. Uh, this is the uh, Pentel 120A 3DX, uh, and this is the uh, Koei Noor. Um, I forget the, it says Versatile on the side, 5900, um, but it's a two millimeter lead holder. Let's see, uh, JD Anarchy says, can you give us a couple of days before your next live stream so I can share them? I have a couple of friends who would love to do this. I would, nothing would make me happier <laughs> than to do that, JD. The only problem that I come up against is that, uh, you know, since I work from home, like while I'm live streaming, you know, uh, my wife is not trapped upstairs, but like it's kind of like if she goes to the kitchen, then you guys get to see her walk by. And I guess that's not like really a big deal or a big problem or anything, but it, it limits a little bit the way that I'm able to like structure this. It's basically like if I can steal some time today, then uh, then I do it. Uh, so I, I want to say yes. In the future, it's my desire to be able to say yes to that. But we'll just see like how the working situation evolves. Uh, and obviously, I can't promise anything about that. I can just do my best. Let's see, Kumari Bukatoki is asking, when I started the pair project, once I got to the proportion right, I freeze on doing shading and showing value. I'll separate light and shadow, but then I don't know how to move forward. It's all about hatching. Uh, well, you know, I mean, kind of yes and no is the uh, unfortunate answer that I have to give to that. Uh, yes, value does have to do with hatching, um, but also it just kind of happened, like, you have to start to understand, and this is why, all right, so back to the uh, drawing foundations, um, and the drawing fundamentals uh, program that, that I've set out. The reason I, I talk at first about, the, about like facing our basic premise in drawing uh, is because so much of the rest of drawing kind of comes out of that, right? Your paper is flat. Your subject is round. That is the basis of the problem you need to solve. Other things that we try to do to solve those problems, like use perspective, for instance, this is a reaction to the fact that your paper is flat and you need to show depth. Now, if you use perspective well, you can conquer that problem. You can, you can solve the flatness of the paper. Um, and so, like, uh, to your question, is it all about hatching? No, I mean, it's definitely not all about hatching. Uh, I mean, hatching is really just the, uh, the technical application that we use to illustrate the ideas that we know we need to use. So what it's really about is planes, right? So understanding what planes are facing towards the light and what are facing away from the light. This skull, from left to right, is round. From top to bottom, it's also round. And so I need to use values that indicate the light source in relationship to those planes in such a way that reflects their orientation or their direction in relationship to that light source. So you can see as I, that's as simple as I can put it as well, um, how much more than, than, than hatching it is. It's about understanding the direction of the form in relationship to the light source uh, and therefore also understanding very well the light source itself. Um, essentially, right, if you, if you try to boil it down further than that, you're going to start maybe uh, oversimplifying things, I think. You know, if you, if you just start to say like, yeah, you just like smooth out the edges on the way to the, to the light shape or something. You know, I think that's an oversimplification. Uh, so you got to kind of respect 
the complicated nature of it and just try to understand the direction of the light source in relationship to the form is going to indicate the value that you have to have in order to appropriately show the whole set of relationship of, of planes in relationship to light. Sorry, I couldn't uh, have, um, have done it uh, uh, more simple than that, or said it more simple than that. Uh, let's say, uh, oh yeah, so a follow-up question, is it about building value? Um, uh, Dorian Eaton, who's an interesting uh, uh, teacher over at uh, BAA, um, uh, said that the first separating light and shadow separates cast shadow, then move to the half tone and light. Um, what is your thought process? My thought process is uh, um, complex. So, all right, here's here's the thing. <laughs> um, there is a way that you can teach drawing that is kind of procedural, which is to say, first I establish my shadows, then I put in my half tones. Then I, you know, blend them up to the, the center light. That is a procedural way to describe how to, like, make a drawing. But it's kind of like the, um, uh, in saying all these things, I try to be, like, as kind of balanced as possible. Um, and I'm coming across something here that's going to make me sound kind of unbalanced. Uh, I believe that only to a certain extent, drawing should be taught procedurally. And I, I think, without having any conversation with him, I, I can't speak to what any other uh, uh, artist would say, I think probably Dorian would, would eventually say something similar. Um, but again, I, I, I don't know the guy, so I, I, can't, I can't really say for sure. Um, you need to learn the concepts so that you can apply them when necessary when not necessary or when not applicable, applying a concept like that will not work. Uh, and so you kind of want to be aware, like, am I learning a process here or am I learning a concept? If you're learning like only a process, then it's only going to apply to that one situation in which I would say that it has relatively little value. You're looking for things that, that apply across concepts, like across projects, across subject matters. Like those are the things eventually I think that uh, um, create the basis or the foundation uh, for your, your life as an artist. Uh, you know, understanding light and shadow, for instance, and like how they work, how they function, that's different than learning like how to render a pair. They're, they're just different things. They're not even the same uh, uh, endeavor. So just, uh, you know, that's, that's the thing to be aware of. And neither one of those is like a bad thing. It's not bad to learn how to render repair. Like that's, by the way, practicing that, it's a useful tool. Uh, but at the same time, like that's a, that's a, uh, maybe like a technique and that's not, not really a concept. So it, it has necessarily like a kind of a limitation to it. I hope that that was helpful and balanced. I don't want to be unbalanced here. Uh, Marco Fontalan is asking, what's the best way to tone the paper? Uh, well, you got to ask, is it dry toning or wet toning? Um, dry toning is just kind of rubbing a bit of uh, a dry uh, medium on top of the paper, so a bit of graphite or whatever, and then you can kind of pull out your highlights from there. And then uh, wet toning, of course, is, uh, involves like stretching the paper and using inks and other things to, um, uh, to add a value to it. Uh, so, kind of depends upon the effect that you want. Uh, I, I use both liberally. Um, you know, I think that eventually wet toning is great if eventually like you want to use like white chalks and things because you're getting that permanent indelible ink uh, onto the surface and that's, uh, that's really great. Um, but I think probably Usually, like eventually, like actually a combination of the two is not a, it's not a bad thing. I really like mixing kind of dry toning and wet toning. Um, but that's another story. Uh, let's see here. All right, so there's a lot of questions. Oh my goodness, there's a lot of questions remaining and, and I'm probably not going to be able to spend the rest of the time uh, here to answer all of them. Uh, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so many, uh, so many good questions. Um, how long uh, have we been at this? Let's see, it's six o'clock, so we've done our two hours. Um, I guess I can just answer a couple more questions, uh, but then I probably have to go. Uh, Tim asks, Stephen, I see that you studied constructive drawing after leaving the academy. How did you go about that? Um, yeah, man, that's a really cool question. I, I, I'd love to like actually spend a lot of time kind of talking about that because it's a subject really near and dear to my heart. And and if you yeah, like if you look at my work, you notice really distinctly, um, you know, that I had to learn a lot of extra things actually after leaving the academy. Uh, which just speaks also to like, you know, what you have to know going to art school is that you're probably not going to get the whole picture. Hopefully you get, you know, a good amount of the picture, you know, I mean, that's ideal, right? But I had, uh, I feel like two or three different drawing educations, um, all at kind of different times. I think that the first thing, I'll just mention the first thing I started with after the academy that I feel like uh, took me to a bit of a different place um, was actually starting to study sculptures. Not even sculpting myself, but like doing a lot of drawings of sculptures. And um, this was kind of an extension of my appreciation and interest in cast drawing uh, and cast painting um, in that it really allows you to study form very well. And you start to come up against the need for certain solutions that, um, that are generally like constructive in their, in their basis. So that, that was kind of the beginning. Everything after that um, was actually like, there's another really kind of a moment for me was when I started like kind of looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of drawings from like the Repin Academy and just trying to like reverse engineer like, by the way, this is like back in 2007. So, you know, like, it's not like everybody was teaching online at the time, like that, the, that all these ideas were just like hanging out there for you to pick them up. Uh, but I tried to kind of reverse engineer like how they were doing their drawings. Like to try to figure out, wow, how do they have so much uh, like structure and anatomy in these? Like, what, what are they doing that's kind of causing that? and uh, just coming up with my own kind of theories for, for how that would work and then kind of studying the application of those theories uh, into, um, into a drawing. Uh, and, you know, becoming by stages like more and more kind of versatile as an artist and uh, obviously realizing I was kind of onto something in terms of like I need to, I need to have, I need to have several more drawing educations. <laughs> Uh, if I'm going to really know what I'm doing. Um, and it, it may sound like uh, maybe a bit of a bummer if you've like just gone to some academy and uh, you come out and you're like, don't I understand it all already? It's uh, like probably not. Um, you know, but you definitely have like the building blocks to start to understand things. I mean, that's, that's what I got at the academy. It was just the, the capacity to kind of start understanding like I knew about line quality and I knew about, um, you know, uh, values and I knew about uh, visual impression and like a lot of other things that happen after that, you know, you can, you can kind of add to in that, in that way. So cool question. I'd actually love to like kind of take a lot of time to, to talk about that as well. Fabian is asking, do you think it would, do I think it would have reached my current level if I would have only studied online? Uh, pff, absolutely no way in the world to know, um, it just out of a, out of a guess, like, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of factors. I mean, would I have known, I think one of the things that you get studying in person is you get like the scrutiny of your colleagues, right? Uh, so, one of the big things, uh, advantages of the, uh, the school environment, it's actually like all the other people there with you. you um, you're all kind of like learning and growing into this thing together. And because of that, like you're always like talking about and testing out ideas and 
You know what I mean? You're kind of like living it a little bit. And I think that's that 24 seven immersion in it and interaction with your colleagues is such a big deal that, that I think it's difficult to replicate online. Uh, so, you know, that would have been a deficit that I certainly would have had to, to work on or supplement in some way. Um, but like I said, I mean, I just, I don't know. I, I really don't know. I think that uh, if you're very, very talented, I think that, I think it's possible, but you know, you'd have to test, I, I can't say. Uh, MJ asked if it would be sacrilegious to use a stump on Bargs. I don't know. Bargs just a drawing. Uh, Jeff Cosping is asking, do you use the same lead for the entire drawing? Do you change the softness of the leads? Yeah, so the whole reason that, uh, I guess you don't see all these at the same time, but I have duplicates of every pencil that I'm using. So uh, in the 0.3 millimeter mechanical pencils, one is like a 2H and the other is an HB. In the, uh, in the two millimeter lead holders, uh, one of them is a 4H and the other I think is an HB as well. So each of these I use for different things. If I'm drawing darker contour lines, I'm using the HBs. If I'm, if I'm making kind of lighter uh, halftone hatch marks, then I'm gonna be using the, the harder leads. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's highly orchestrated. And, um, uh, and also of course, like I have like a wealth of other uh, kind of pencils. Like if I'm not drawing live, like I, I go deep into the, um, into the archive of like uh, uh, different leads for, for kind of different purposes. And also like if I, you know, I mean, if I'm making like a much longer form drawing, uh, obviously there's a lot more opportunity for um, uh, kind of specialization with uh, different leads. I mean, the values here are so limited, you know, I'm like barely using value. Uh, and this drawing like just in terms of like creating an impression it's more value for the sake of like kind of creating a sense of structure or form uh, so yeah I mean I I definitely use a lot of the same ones throughout but but it's um, there's a lot of variety there as well yeah uh, so right yeah we're totally at the end of time I, I, I have to go um, this is about probably as far as I got I think maybe the next one I'll probably draw like a slightly smaller skull um, uh, and uh, just see kind of how far we get but listen if you guys really like this content that's that's super great just remember to like subscribe turn on notifications uh, so you can join me for the next one I really hope you're drawing along and if you are here and you're not already a subscriber on my patreon uh, all you got to know is that it's an absolute ton of tutorial content for like a really, really, really low price. Uh, and uh, you can find a link in the description of the video or usually I put like a pop up at the end of a video to, to find that as well. Um, but listen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all the questions. I'm really sorry I didn't get to all of them. I know there's like a dozen really great ones that I'm just not going to get to. Uh, but that's, uh, that's life. I'll see you guys next time. Okay, take care.